Uh, thank you all for coming. I am uh, Samantha Wolf. I am founder of Pitchford. It's a marketing and branding consulting uh, company that works with VR and AR companies uh, who want to market and brand themselves and also with brands and agencies who want to integrate marketing and branding. And I have the great pleasure of being the fill-in moderator, which I think that's okay, Rory will be missed, um, for this amazing panel for XR and retail. And so I can't do you guys justice in terms of introducing you each. So if you could go down and please introduce, introduce yourselves before we get started. Awesome, thanks Sam. Uh, my name is Kathy Hackle. Uh, actually, Sam is my co-author. We wrote the first VR era marketing book called Marketing New Realities. Uh, I work as a futurist for You Are Here Labs in Atlanta, one of the top XR labs. We've worked with brands like Porsche, Lexus, Carnival Cruise Lines, NBC Sports. Uh, and before that, I was a virtual reality evangelist for HT HTC Vive. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Irina Cronin. I'm president and partner at Transformation Group and also president and CEO of my own consultancy, Spout Reality. Uh, both pretty much do the same thing. Um, they consult uh, Fortune 500 companies and also AR and VR companies that want to do apps and do more with uh, basically business to business. Uh, before all of this stuff, I was more into finance. I was an equity research analyst, so I really understand companies. I'm Kelly Candle. I'm an executive producer at MediaMonks. Uh, MediaMonks is the largest digital production company in the world with a big focus on VR, AR, and experiential. And we work with brands and agencies. Hi, so my name is Dave Nickens. I'm the head of emerging technologies at build.com or our parent company is ferguson.com, so pretty much look across all of, recently promoted look across all of B2C. Uh, my primary role there is to look forward into technologies that can help commerce. And I'm really interested in emerging commerce, uh, immersive commerce, and how that affects our uh, online e-tail. Well, one of the top, build.com itself is one of the top, in the top 100 for the US as far as online only retailers. Um, we don't have physical store locations, so when AR came along, it was a great use case for us. Yeah, that's great. So I have read that XR retail is going to be a $1.6 billion industry, and we're not, we're not quite there yet, um, but it's coming. So my first question is, um, mobile AR seems to be driving a lot of the retail activity. Um, what is your favorite XR retail experience, whether it's in AR, even VR? And Dave, I'm going to start with you and go and go back now. Well, of course, it's the Build.com app. <laughs> we just I should have prefaced <laughs> it with saying that's not your own. <laughs> oh no, you can't do that to me. <laughs> well, you can say your own. Okay. It's fine. So, so we just finished uh, delivering this. It's um, featured in the app stores, uh, both um, Apple App Store and Google Play, uh, for um, commerce, for AR commerce, AR shopping. Um, you just won several or two Appy Awards, uh, 2018 Appy Awards. So really excited about sort of the, what we did there. We just thought blue sky and said, you know, what can we do to build, uh, get out of the customer's way, build an app that really allowed them to to find what they're looking for out of the, the millions of things of, of home improvement products that we sell. And then once we had that established, we partnered with Apple to launch um, the AR Kit experience, and we took a different approach being a product geek and just sort of thinking through the customer and the, the outcomes and the use cases, I, I said, I want to do it differently. I, I don't want to just hack it. You know, I want to start from scratch. I want to start from the CAD files. I want to hire 3D modelers. And I want to make these products work like they work in real life because we don't have a physical retail uh, location. Where they, don't, they can't showroom us. We're online only. So what we did primarily with the, with the starting board, of course, we're for profit. So we can't mess around with money. So we had to you know, test our way into things. So the first pro 40 products that we launched with Apple um, last September was faucets and lights. And faucets, I said, hey, let's, op let's make a faucet work. And so if you look today, you can see it work. It's, you turn on hot and cold. You see the handle movement. Does it hit my backsplash? You know, you, when you turn on the hot water, the steam comes up. I mean, it's, it's full immersion, I mean, the mixed reality at its best. And, and we just didn't cut corners. You know, a lot of people are photo stitching and doing all this other stuff that just didn't meet the quality and the standard of the products that we sell. Right. 
So, Kelly, your well, favorite. I'm going to follow Dave's lead. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned uh, a project we worked on, uh, which was uh, with one of our retail partners, Tommy Hilfiger. Uh, and this one launched the end of last year, and it was part of their Tommy Snap app. Uh, and the concept is, how do we bring consumers closer to the fashion shows? Right. And so what we did is we, in Volumetric, captured a couple of the models in all the different looks. And so you're able to pick the outfits, click AR, see those models rendered, uh, and then actually pre-order those items from the app as well. So that was probably my favorite one yeah. from last year. Be able to connect it is great to yeah. actual sales. And what about you? So my favorite one is probably one that many people have already tried and is the Ikea app in your room. Oh, I love that one too. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the smoothest ones around and I did a, a huge test of all of the retail apps for furniture and also competitors for Ikea and believe me, it's the best one out there. So I don't have anything very sexy, but it, <laughs> it, it works really well. Yeah. No, but I think that that brings up a good point of AR and utility. Yes. Like I've used that one. I have a very small space and I was trying to figure out the right coffee table and I was able to, through that app and that utility, able to make that purchase price. Yeah. We've actually seen that boost in confidence uh, in, our, in our metrics as we've launched those first 40 and then following on with the next 500 uh, assets and as we model them out and, and launch them into the the customer experience. I don't know if you guys have metrics around this, but for us, we saw a 400% uh, increase in, in sales for those products. We saw a 25% increase in sessions for those people, because the next thing that they did was like, I have to show you something. They went to their friends, they went you know, to, to their um, significant others, and they, they said, you gotta see this, this is amazing. Uh, and you know, increase in AOV, 75%, you know, increase right. in AOV, it's, it's just been amazing. Well, increasing that conversation ends up driving sales. And Kathy, what's yeah, yours? To add to the IKEA app, and it's not my favorite, I've got another one, but um, <laughs> I, what I have heard is that their next step is actually using AR to help people put together the furniture, because uh, I know a lot of people, <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. IKEA can be quite <laughs> yeah. a challenge. Um, I would say m my favorite experience is actually something that a lot of people have probably not had access to yet. Um, it's uh, a company out of Toronto called Quantum Capture that does digital humans. I was able to see a live demo of one of their digital humans uh, who's eventually going to be used as a a concierge at Walmart, and uh, it was pretty impressive. It's a you know a scan of a real uh, real actor and everything, and they powered it vo with voice and with AI, so you could ask him different things. Uh, it was pretty. Uh, I would say it was pretty pretty interesting to see how that might um, work very well in the future. That's great, uh, Irina. I'm going to start with you now. Yes. Uh, what situation calls for XR with retail, and how do you decide whether it makes sense or not? Okay, so. Um, I think for the average consumer who is not able to see something um, in person is the most obvious thing. Uh, it would have to be an object that would have some kind of texture to it, some kind of size probably to it, um, that they would want to measure in some way, in some capacity to fit somewhere. Um, and that could also be on their body. <laughs> so. Um, Something that um, is attractive to them that they're curious about and yet aren't exactly 100% sure whether they should go forward with it. And this is a way of adding some more information to that. Um, and not only that, enabling them to go through with the purchase right after. Right. So it's, it is an extreme, extremely good for utility that way. There's some loud noises <laughs> coming from that. That's OK. Something exciting. Uh, and Kelly, do you have? Yeah, I would, I would say there's many use cases. I think it falls into two buckets, whether it's a pain point, where maybe it is you don't, you know, and I know a lot of our partners have a problem with this, is fit is a big thing for consumers. So are we able to tap into helping them understand fit a little bit better? Maybe there's an avatar and you're able to see it on your own figurine. Mm -hmm. um, or is it in the bucket of entertainment and kind of that, X Factor bringing in brand ethos and style. Uh, Lacoste has a great AR app, which is kind of trying on the shoe. But surrounding that, you know, is the whole experience of different graphics, which are very aligned with their style guide. So I think it's kind of those two buckets, I think, are good. And Kathy? Um, I think we're starting to see a lot of it being implemented, obviously, with chatbots. Mm -hmm. uh, if anyone was at the Facebook AR talk, they talked about how they sold out of the 
uh, the tennis shoes that they announced, you know, the AR <laughs> tennis shoes they, they were showing um, within an hour of them announcing it at F8. Uh, and I'm starting to see that. I don't know if you guys have played around with any of that, but um, it was before uh, Sephora launched theirs, but Estee Lauder had lip artists, and you could like use the AR chatbot to try on the makeup and buy it. Um, you know, and I think that that to the to the uh, point of utility, like I'm already purchasing things on my phone and through social media. It just makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So you can you can you can't shelve everything, right? You can't shelve everything, especially home improvement items. They're, they're bulky. They're big. Uh, you can't have every finish. And so where we're envisioning this, especially for Ferguson showrooms is a way to immerse the customer in all the things in the details that are not necessarily available and also help, help them along a self-guided journey uh, in shopping. A lot of customers come in the showroom. You know, they, they want to they just look and compare and they want to they have that online experience and a physical retail with the tactile experience. And so the question is for us is how do you complement that? Uh, how do you bring them information that might not necessarily be there price points that are adjusted to their uh, uh, in relationship with the company, you know, which you, you have a, just a generic price tag on things, but what if you could customize that specifically for that customer when they walk in the door, knowing that they're a value customer, they've spent X amount of dollars over the years, or they're a contractor or a pro, and, you know, the, they're working with you. How can we envision a new shopping experience there? Right. And, and that's really <laughs> all the things you could not necessarily show them, that they might want or pivot off the visual aspect of an item. So lights, for example, are things that are, you want one that's like that, but you don't know how to describe it. And so if you can uh, tag in some of the, the uh, visual search elements along with AR to show that maybe you don't have it in stock, but you have you know, 20 or 30 like structured uh, products for sale, right. can you step someone into that? And then what is the conversion uh, increase on that. Well, I think there's there's a lot of consumers that want that sort of omni-channel experience that connects the digital with the physical, and yep. I think that that you know. And that's where we're going with the glasses, right? I mean, we're all yeah. building a world where glasses work. Um, that at the at the that's the bottom line is is we're building the metadata with with geolocation services turned on with image recognition and uh, computer vision where you can where the glasses and not have to pull your phone out every five seconds and you just automatically immersed. Yeah, well there's, I mean, there's even projection based AR that started um, to develop too with, you know, full disclosure, a company that I consult with. <laughs> but it, I mean, Lampix ends up, you don't even have to put the glasses on so at least it can, it can work, um, work for you uh, at retail now as opposed to waiting. Um, for the glasses to be more ubiquitous. And what were you going to um, say, I think Kathy? it's a great opportunity for passion brands. For example, mm -hmm. at your here, we helped Porsche get started with AR. And, um, you know, when it, the project that we did for them was actually first for the HoloLens, then we parted, ported it to ARKit. It's about designing and customizing your own, you know, Porsche in, you know, in your, in your, uh, in your garage or whatever it is. So I think that it's a great opportunity, especially. Yeah, you know, absolutely. So customization and having that. Yeah. On the flip side, um, have you ex seen any examples where XR does not work for retail and any lessons or key takeaways from, from that? And I'll start with you since I haven't started with you yet. Uh, no, no, no. Oh, Next, be, okay. uh, you'll be second. Um, <laughs> I won't name names. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think for me, as I, I work with brands and clients and agencies, uh, the projects that don't work well or there's not a real reason for it or there's not a budget for it. And you're just doing it for the sake of having, you know, checking that box we did an AR project. Mm -hmm. um, I think those are the ones that kind of fall flat. Uh, but I, I do think um, that with the right strategy, you can always find a workaround or maybe it's not, you know, AR, maybe it's a VR thing, but you should just have a reason why you're playing in that space in the first place. Dave? I I tell my team we're not doing plop and spin. I'm sorry, it's not not <laughs> explain not, not plop. Here. Explain so, plop. So and people spin. just don't put the time and energy into building good models and good representations of their products. So we don't just you don't just throw we don't just hack it. I mean we're not going to take shortcuts. I think when you take shortcuts, it's a real bad experience. People the customer they don't benefit from it. Um, it doesn't represent 
you know, the products that you sell accurately, and they can't make decisions on it. So I mean, yeah, size accuracy, you know, with, with AirKit and AirCore is very, very close, and that's a huge thing, especially, you know, like has capitalized on that a lot. Uh, but when you're looking at you know, fit and finish and how that fits into a, a room, and you're buying a you know three thousand or thirty thousand dollar chandelier, uh, you know if you're if you have you know you've cut out too many polys or you've trying to take a bunch of images and put it together to make this thing look like something, or it's connected to your camera and you're moving around and trying to you know it's it's the customer knows and and it's a very bad experience and it gives us all who are working on really immersed deep immersed accurate representative uh, representative dis, uh, experiences a bad name because because you'll say they, they, they look at that junk and they walk away they're like oh it's not there yet you know but there are companies that are working from the ground up to build something and I think um, you know you could tell who's who's doing that yeah absolutely I mean you felt like you had a, a response yeah. to that <laughs> <laughs> I could see the movement <laughs> so I'm actually not such a great fan of mobile AR in general. Um, I, I've seen all of the headset AR offerings, um, even the experimental ones that a lot of people haven't seen. And um, I have great promise for uh, what's to come in AR. I mean, a tremendous improvement, like you have no idea. So when you ask like what isn't so great, um, I'd say that a lot of <laughs> most of it is going to be a lot of the mobile <laughs> AR, whether it's for retail or anything else, uh, is lacking and looks experimental and kind of pieced together, yeah. like what you were saying. So um, the good news is I don't think that we're going to have to wait that long uh, to be able to get to the the headset AR. Uh, we're building a lot of the AI that goes along with that, the machine learning that would go with that, the computer vision, and all of that would really work extremely well with the headset. And we're just about like about a year and a half to two years before that could come. And by that time, people I think with mobile AR are going to be like, okay, we're done with this. Let's try the headset. That's just like how I see it. I see the evolution going into the glasses. Oh yeah. Just uh, everything we're building now. It's going into eyewear. It's getting it, yeah. It, it, we're, it's the foundation it for eyewear in the future. I mean, that's that's where everyone's going to be. Yeah, I see. I just, <laughs> I end up saying. I mean, I love wearing glasses, but I don't think everybody wants to wear glasses. I mean, maybe I'm going to get in trouble for saying that. Sorry, <laughs> but you know, we'll we'll see. So, anything else to add, or do you want the next question, oh, let's Kathy? Go to the next one, yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, what is uh, the missing opportunity with retail and XR right now? Um, it could be an industry you believe can benefit from using XR in retail, or it can be an underutilized approach. What do you think? For me? Yeah, for you. Um, I speak at a lot of marketing conferences, and when I get out of our bubble, I realize how far ahead a lot of us are. Um, <coughs> get out there and start talking to people. And a simple, simple missed opportunity, I think Facebook 3D posts, um, where they're able to kind of showcase an item and you know and people people are on Facebook they're looking at it they can you know turn it around and twirl it and then purchase it if they want to I think that that has been kind of a missed opportunity I when the, when I've talked to marketers they're like what is that how does that <laughs> even work how, how do I do this do I need you know I'm like no it's not that complicated um, so I think that that's a kind of a definitely a missed opportunity of them understanding the ecosystem and in how you know social media and AR are are integrated, so. Dave, anything? Uh, you know what, I, I think everyone, sh there's this race that's going on with models. It, it, the missing component for all of this is asset digitization. That's the missing <laughs> component. Yeah. I mean, if you had assets, then you can, then you can pivot and you can uh, ideate and you can innovate on top of that foundation and the found that piece of the foundations is missing right now. There's some though that are out there. Is it just not? But so okay. So and then as part of this, we're right. we're legal hell right? Legal negotiations <laughs> with who's own, who yeah. owns these things. Mm -hmm. These are these are uh, derivative content of goods that are owned by a company, right? So yeah. so who owns it? And, and it's, it's a new for for all legal. It's a new area. And, and we're, we're figuring it out as we go, right? But who's gonna centralize that content repository that everyone can draw from for all the things 
that You're we gonna say do. blockchain, aren't you? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know? it's like, where's that company? I want to invest. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, there, there are a few that have popped up and that have made, you know, made strides towards it and, and towards solving some of these things. You know, we, some of the basics of AR are missing. Diminished reality is one of the things that's missing. You can't subtract. Like, right. there's there's just basic things that you need to, to put there in order for it to to work in, in e-commerce. Um, we're getting there, but if, if we could solve the asset problem, it, we'd go a lot faster. Um, we're all having to do, spend money and resources. And oh, by the way, 3D modelers are now worth their weight in gold. So if anybody has kids, put them through 3D modeling <laughs> training. <laughs> so now it's, they're going to. Uh, Irene or Kelly, any, anything to I add? I you jump in since you didn't answer the last question. Oh, no, one. I did. Uh, she uh, was the first no. one to answer. Oh, okay. So. Um, <laughs> all right. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about utility. Right, which is great because that's the first thing you jump to um, when it comes to, I mean, obviously retailers want you to buy their goods. Yeah. So they're gonna make it as practical as possible to get that to happen. Um, but it's something that you had also mentioned, Kelly, um, having to do with perhaps luxury and some kind of fantasy that is connected to retail that is natural in advertising uh, like forever Mm -hmm. But when it comes to marketing with AR, that's kind of stripped away because we're not there yet in terms of what's well, aspirational. Yeah, it's not as much aspirational out there as it is like useful utility. Right. Yep. I mean, it's my guess is it's going to get there because that's what sells. Not right. only the utility but the branding. Right and the gloss that goes along with the retail and just getting somebody really enticed to buy something? Well, that's what I, I saw the Google talk earlier today about um, designing with AR and realizing that you don't necessarily have to design within the frame that is your mobile phone. And I feel like right now we're still very much, and this was a great point that she made about designing very much within the mobile phone. Yeah. And if you looked around in a retail environment and saw I don't know, whatever is appropriate, brand appropriate, that it becomes a much more engaging and interactive experience. And I haven't, I mean, I personally haven't seen that that much. I don't know if you have, but mm. any anything else to add or? Um, I would say a particular sector, but I was reading recently that 40% of consumers said they would pay more for a product if they had an AR experience attached oh, to it. I have these things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 61% of shoppers prefer stores which offer augmented reality experiences, 71 would return more often, and 40 would pay more for a product um, if, if they could experience it at AR, and almost 70% uh, of consumers expect retailers to launch an AR app within the next six months, but despite that, nearly two-thirds of companies don't use AR. Yeah. So, sorry. Yeah, no. <laughs> I cheated. It's on my phone. So <laughs> The stats really show that they want this content. So I would say a missed opportunity is not taking the time and putting a strategy behind it. Because we're often, often having partners come to us, and there's a big campaign, and it's just the small ad. Oh, just throw in the AR, the VR thing, and not putting time, strategy, and a budget behind it. Um, when you know it is so powerful for consumers, and they're going to be spending more. Right. I mean, it needs to be at the from the beginning in the creative brief for what's going on. And it's only going to get bigger as yeah. you look at Gen Z and what they like to do. And, you know, we were just talking about that the other day. Right. Um, if you look at their preferences, it's just going to get bigger and bigger. And it's interesting that you bring luxury into the mix because I was reading an article on how Gen Z is not that excited about the old school, what we think old school luxury items are. They're looking right, that's what I else. posted, yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to kind of see how it shifts. Um, and I'm, I just want to add a kind of a, a quick example. Yeah. It's, it's retail, but it's not necessarily AR. Um, I was at Sam's. I posted about this the other day. I was at Sam's and... Not they, my, not my no, place. No, no, Sam's Costco. <laughs> so, yes. And they had a human sampler on this side. You know, if you go to Sam's or Costco, you know they give out tons of food samples, right? Um, so there was the human sampler here, the food demonstrator, and then they actually had a food sampler robot uh, right across. And I just stood there because I was, I had never seen it before and I stood there and kind of just watched who goes to which person. And I saw a lot more people go to the human sampler, but they were mostly, you know, uh, you know, 30 and up, let's say yeah. 30 and up. So the people that were going to the robot were younger. Right. And I said, this is a very interesting uh, predictor. I mean, it's not scientific at all, obviously, yeah. but a predictor of 
what it could look like in the future. Right. I mean, uh, so in my m more research that I did, as I said, that actually not Gen Z, but millennials are more likely than baby boomers to shop in a physical store. And so you have to sort of think about what is it that they, they want and what's going to bring them in if the opportunity is available. Yeah, okay. I saw an article that said 80%, I think I tweeted this, 80% of uh, millennials will not go see a new home unless there's a virtual tour. <laughs> like, that's where we're going. I mean, there's a demand, and then it's going to even become more of a demand when you get towards Gen Z. You know, it's, it's, it's a, going from a, a, a tell me to a show me society. Right. You know, it's really, no one's going to read manuals anymore. Unless you bring that manual to life, like, you know, and, and really Which there's a company, it. I talked to a company earlier today, and that's what they're doing. They're bringing I mean, it's life. exactly right. I mean, no one wants, no one cares about, about that flat image. Show me. Show, right. me, show me how that thing explodes. And that, that part comes up, that the, those products come together. Uh, you know, don't, don't tell me about it. Let me experience it. And, and that's the evolution. Okay, excellent. Um, and I'll just open up the next couple of questions. Any of you, whoever wants to go. Uh, what do you think about location-based XR and retail? Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I happen to love location-based everything. Um, including VR, like I'm a great proponent of that. Um, now, of course, there are going to be privacy concerns for everybody, uh, but I think everybody's already beyond that because there's been location-based stuff in your phone, uh, on your computer, on your laptop when you're traveling. If you want to have it, you'll have it. You turn it on, and most people leave it on. Okay, so, um, and who doesn't want to get a deal? if it's available, if it matches up to what you're interested in. And of course, we're getting closer and closer to understanding the algorithms and the machine learning and all that kind of stuff to figure out what people's tastes are as long as we opt in to do that. So um, I think it would be spectacular if, of course, you can turn it off at any time. You pass by a store, whether in your car, you're in your car walking by, and um, it shows you, uh, I don't know if you're looking for a shirt or something like that of a particular color. They hap your computer happens to know, your phone happens to know what you're interested in. And voila, there it is. And not only that, it provides you the price. And it gives you comparisons of other stores so that you can see like, where you want to go. So I don't see any downside to that. Because, like I said, if you don't want to opt in, you don't have to. So it's not going to bombard you just like that. Uh, I think there was a video a couple of years ago with the AR popping up from. Yeah, that's <laughs> monstrous. And like nobody wants that. And we won't do it because nobody wants that. That's right. human. <laughs> Anybody? No, I'll just echo that. I, yeah. I feel the same way. Uh, anytime that it can be curated for me, you know, there's so many things vying for my attention. Um, opting in and also with those guardrails of not being inundated like that crazy video. Um, I'm all for it. I think it's great. Any other? Okay, I'll go to the last question so we'll have time um, for questions from the audience. How far off do you think we are from v commerce? And I know Kathy's going to want to answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> You're a futurist, Kathy. Yeah. I mean, go on. That's the thing. I mean, like, tell me a year. It's like, I don't no. think you can necessarily put a year. Like, everyone's like, 2020. Um, I mean, I think it's progressing, I think it's accelerating. Um, one of the things I'm really looking into right now is digital humans, which I referred to earlier. Um, CGI influencers, for example, instead of, I'm not sure how many of you guys have heard of little Michaela, uh, and she's Instagram famous, she's got over a million followers, she's not real. Mm -hmm. um, but she gets deals, she like models for Louis Vuitton and like does all these things and she sells. Um, and I'm kind of really interested in that. Um, there's that little hologram that does concerts all across Asia. Uh, I'm really interested in, in what's coming next in that sense, you know, because we always talk within sales and marketing, influencer marketing, you know, whether the Kardashian is, you know, Kardashian selling you something. In this case, it's a CGI influencer. So I'm interested in seeing how that progresses into holograms and how we move forward. Um, I know there's a few holographic displays uh, already. Uh, there's one out here near room X, XK, uh, holo holographic concierge all the way over there. And I believe there will be several um, holographic concierge type 
displays at the, in the playground and um, in there. So it'll be interesting to see how it all kind of progresses. So. so for the rest of you, how far off from v-commerce do you think? So it's a combination of three things. Okay. Based. So one is bandwidth. And so right now I have to reduce the size of the objects that we're producing the products you know, to some, some size that you can consume within a reasonable upload time. So anywhere from one to eight megabytes for a, for a product, right? That all goes away with 5G. So the, I think that's one of the constraints that opens us up to immersive commerce, right, and v-commerce. The second thing on here is the, uh, the ability for the eyewear, and I've said it several times, to, to reduce and to, to come to a form factor which uh, is the, with a life expectancy, a battery life expectancy and uh, wearability so you don't look like you're an alien you know, walking through the world, uh, that, that form factor has to, to get to some steady state. Uh, and the third is that, that foundation of assets um, that everyone is, is going after for the industry. And some consolidation or some uh, general platforms that we can all pull from in order to, to utilize these things, or it's gonna be a race to see who can innovate in this space and get ahead and the others are gonna be left behind. By the time you realize you need assets, it's, it's gonna to be too late. Uh, Do you want to add? Yeah, um, so I can't name names here because there's lots of NDAs around. <laughs> Fred, uh, like, like NDA in the <laughs> VR and AR space? I've never heard of that. So there's one particular company that I know where they have some cheerleaders in the company that want to develop this for v-commerce for sure right now. So they, they are very aware that they need about a two year lead time to do that. Uh, but they're being held back by basic business segment areas in their company. It's a really big company. And um, so the people at the top don't believe in it yet and they have other things to worry about. So it's basically not going to happen on time for them. Um, I think in general, um, you, you mentioned 2020, I think 2020, if Apple comes out with their headset or glasses, whichever configuration it is, and then you need about a year of uh, people buying the headsets, and then you have these companies who, there are some brilliant companies out there that are developing for it, they will be ready for it. So I think maybe 2021, 2022, you'll really get to see that happening, e-commerce. Right. Any Last. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. If, if Apple comes out, you know, um, magically becomes comes something a non-alien, and you know, then we have the 5G, uh, you know, hit at the same time. That's that's what I'm looking for. That that's at the point when you're you're going to see most. Of, I predict, you know, Gen Gen Z, Gen uh, Millennials, um, maybe into, even into Gen Xers who are early adopters, um, start utilizing the, the technology. I mean, we already have geofencing. You can already detarget an advertisement through geofencing. Um, now when you start displaying those things and, and people like a push notification, I want to see that thing in their, in their eyewear um, based on you know, their preferences and their relationship with the companies that they're passing by, uh, that all becomes very minority report, I know, but it becomes a thing and it's, it's a real thing. Great. Anything else? Note or no? Or, I mean, I think we... We only have a couple more minutes yeah. anyways. I, I think it just depends where the hardware and the software companies are. The content creators are always gonna be there ready, but they need the tools, um, they need the integration with the APIs, they need the capabilities. Okay. So I'm not gonna put a year on it. Okay, so we have an anonymous question. Uh, what's the holy grail of XR engagement? Is it views, interactions, transactions, or other? Who wants to take that one? So I, I, I really think it's around brand immersion. Um, pe people. You, I mean, I'll just, <laughs> sorry, being the marketing branding person. There, yeah, I, I mean, of course. Why do people download your app, right? Because they want a relationship with you as a company. Uh, why do they use the, why, why, how do you build that relationship? Know who, know who the customer is, get out of their way. You know, give them the services and the goods that they, they want, they came to you for. Uh, it, it, when, you, when you offer it above and beyond that sort of standard shopping experience, an immersive shopping experience. Wow, you know, now I've really, I'm really building relationship and I'm that go-to 
app that you're going to come. And now the web, you know, with with what's coming out with Google and everything. So now I'm, I'm that go-to brand or that that partner to, to get you what you want. Any other? Any other? Well, I think we had a really interesting discussion the other day on metrics mm -hmm. and uh, immersive uh, technology. On you know, everyone's going to ask for the ROI. What's the ROI right. of this campaign? What's the ROI of what, what we did? Um, and we're having a really interesting discussion about, you know, do we need to create, are we creating new metrics? You know, do, are we, do we need to create something like return on engagement or, you know, whatever that would translate into. But, you know, there's definitely going to be, you know, new metrics, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's a question of when they say transactions, it's like how many initially, there's probably not necessarily a lot initially, and then it's going to grow. Yep. In there, so it's it's more about the brand experience, and that goes. From Plus, I think that once we move forward, and there's more more of these experiences, like where do people get stuck in the funnel? You know, what what is it that's stopping them? Mm -hmm. And we'll have more data and be able to kind of say, okay, if they're stuck in this part, what can we do to meet them in that part, and and kind of push the sale forward. Right. So. Okay, I I'm gonna go in order. Have you already rolled out a VR training? So I, I'm trying to think of. Is there tra there training opportunities within retail? I feel like, right? Does anybody? Oh, they've already been done over okay. the last three, four years, even, um, and they're continuing to do it. So that's more on the, yeah. not on the consumer well, level. Walmart, Walmart trains their employees yeah. in VR. Um, yeah. Right. You know, and it's. I mean, it's a retail example, but I I was able to ass to um, kind of assist UPS as a virtual reality expert when they were launching their VR training. Right. And it's not necessarily retail per se. Yeah, um, that's but, you know, I guess why I got it. It has to do with the, the sale of, of goods and right. how they get to you. Um, but, but it's about the consumer experience that you said, yeah. like yeah. What's, gonna, what's gonna drive sales and what's gonna drive brand, like sort of awareness, engagement, and, and purchase help. Well, and to that funnel. point of VR, um, a company from New York called Uvisit had made a partnership with MasterPass and Swarovski, and it was a whole shopping experience in VR. Um, for their home line, you know, it's crystal vases and things that you're not going to find everywhere, and you were able to kind of buy in the headset. It was connected to MasterPass, so you could por purchase directly. Right. Yeah. I'm going to skip and then go, because I think you sort of answered a little so, bit about air. Oh, one more. more thing on training. Sure. Um, so the way the, for, for B2B for us, you know, Ferguson being the largest plumbing supplier out there, um, w there's, a, there's an aging workforce that, that's leaving the workforce, but has great knowledge so the question is how do you empower the, the new generation maybe that hasn't spent the time in in the field to do the things that that work aging workforce is, is has done can they support in another fashion right so this is a question that, that we're asking in in this larger sort of a blue collar area is how can we empower the workforce the younger workforce to be as precise and experienced as those who are leaving the, the role with 50 years experience. Right, absolutely. Um, so this is another question. Do you think foot tracking could become a thing for virtual try-ons? I think, I mean, it's another metric, right? At least for me, that it's what it, it feels like. I don't think it'll be a major one, but something that maybe someone would measure. Any other questions down that you guys can see them too that you want to? <laughs> I mean, it's it's not really foot tracking necessarily. Yeah. But there's a, a startup in San Francisco that does 3D scans of your feet because people tend to have one feet larger than the other and stuff. You know, right. if you go to buy shoes, they're all the same. But this company does a 3D scan of your feet and you can get these, like, it, they're like beautiful um, $250 um, uh, heels that, you know, I don't have and I don't have a pair yet, but um, but you supposedly are more comfortable because they're made from a 3D scan of your feet and, you know, one shoe might be bigger than the other, et cetera. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. Ooh. And I think that yeah. that is <laughs> it yep. for us. And thank you so much for, for joining me on the panel. It was, it was great and good discussion and hope everybody enjoyed it. Yeah.